We are really fortunate to get a substantial um, grant to fund this meeting, and I want you to hear a little bit about the UC Discovery Grant uh, System. Um, so my name is Jenny Cox, and I'm from uh, the Industry University Cooperative Research Program, the IUCRP, and um, we're part of the UC Office of the President, and our brief is to help um, researchers on the UC campuses to connect with uh, California companies. And uh, we do that through a number of different mechanisms that I'm just going to briefly touch on today to tell you a little bit about before this industry panel gets started. Um, and I'll uh, hang around for the rest of the lunch hour, so if you have any questions, you can ask me either after my talk or um, I should be around uh, af after this panel discussion. Um, so the IUCRP, as I mentioned, was formed to foster uh, outstanding early stage research throughout the University of California system um, in areas that are of strategic importance to California industry. Um, so we have three units within our organization, one that uh, works with the UC Discovery Grant, one that works with economic research, sort of making public the impacts that the IUCRP has on uh, the economy of California. <laughs> And then the third, uh, research, and de research Development and New Initiatives Unit, and that's the unit I'm part of. So I come out to campuses like this and I talk to people who are either doing research in the academic side or the industrial side to try to make those connections to get inventions out of the university where they're created and into the private sector where they can be developed and benefit the citizens of California, and in the case of this seminar, the world. So um, we offer the UC Discovery Grant, which is one of our uh, mechanisms, as a matching grant uh, between UC researchers and California companies. And we define California companies as a company that has either R&D or manufacturing in California. And the benefit is that the companies can leverage their research dollars to essentially double the size of their research budget um, if it's a research project that's sponsored at UC. And so, as you can see, uh, the company provides part of the funding. We, the state of California, through our program, provides part of the funding. And then the research goes on in a UC laboratory. So it's a good deal for everyone. Um, our program receives $15 million a year from the state of California. And it's intended to benefit the California economy by benefiting California companies and therefore enhancing their competitiveness. So these are the many benefits of partnering with UC, which considering it's a primarily academic audience, I probably don't need to tell you this. Um, but we tell the companies that um, you know, by having access to UC scientists and students, um, that's a very high caliber, high caliber group to work with. Uh, the research uh, we expect will be conducted at UC facilities. Um, and with the state funds plus the industry match, you're doubling the size of your research budget. Um, when it comes to intellectual property, Carol can probably tell you more about it than I can. but. Um, the uh, IUCRP doesn't have any specific IP requirements of our own, but we do expect that standard UC policies will apply. And so if a company is interested, for instance, in negotiating an exclusive license, which um, many pharma companies are often interested in, um, then the project can be treated as if the company has paid for the full cost of the research project, which they like. Uh, we have a pretty short turnaround time between when the project is submitted and when research can begin. It's usually around 100 days. And there may be additional um, state tax credits in addition to, to the uh, federal R&D tax credits um, that companies can get for sponsoring research at UC. Uh, we support research in eight fields of science, uh, which are listed right here. Uh, we recently um, added three new areas, which are energy, health and wellness, and nanotechnology. Um, they were part of a pilot, two-year pilot project, and already they make up 3% of our portfolio. So we know that they're actually quite important to um, the UC researchers and to industry in California. So there are a lot of places where um, research in, in the areas that you guys are working in could fit potentially. Um, in addition to the eight fields, we also encourage interdisciplinary research that spans multiple fields and research at the emerging interfaces between these fields. And so what we hope uh, this, is, this does is it enables UC researchers who um, maybe are starting on a new field or a new project to sort of be able to do the proof of concept for their research and then to go on and um, seek funding from other federal um, organizations that maybe don't uh, fund quite as uh, high, uh, high risk research as we do. Uh, we have two funding mechanisms, the research and training grants and the collaboration and education grants. The difference is basically the number of uh, PIs and campuses that need to be involved in, in each. 
The research and training grants are our most flexible mechanism. You can have one or more investigators, one or more campuses, one or more companies. Uh, the company contribution can be in a mixture of cash and in-kind or just cash. Um, with the intercampus collaboration education grants, uh, we do require that there be two or more campuses participating, and the company contribution has to include a uh, significant in-kind contribution. And what we ask is that um, the PIs develop an education uh, um, plan around that significant in-kind contribution. So in the past, um, for uh, electronics manufacturing and new materials, they designed an entire lab course around, you know, sort of a million dollar piece of equipment that a company donated, so that kind of thing. So just to recap, we're interested in high risk, high payoff um, projects uh, that involve multidisciplinary opportunities. Um, we look for opportunities to engage early career faculty um, in this research to help them sort of prove their track record. And we look for unique educational opportunities for grad students on dissertation quality research topics. So we don't want people doing sort of, you know, uh, work, for, work for industry that they wouldn't normally uh, ask their grad students to do. And then research training for postdocs is also quite important. Uh, to date, we've funded close to 1,000 partnerships between uh, multiple UC researchers and students and postdocs. Uh, we've involved um, 509 industry sponsors, which includes 60 startups. Sometimes it's a little harder for startups to participate in our program just because you have to show that you have the intention of doing R&D or manufacturing in California, and sometimes that's a, hard, a high bar for the startups. Um, we get uh, one-third of our sponsors each year are new sponsors, uh, which means two-thirds of our sponsors are returning customers. Um, they may work with the same researcher at a campus, or they may work with a different researcher at the campus, but it's a pretty good uh, return rate. And to date, um, including the investment from the state of California and the companies, we've invested um, $353 million in research at UC. So um, I just wanted to touch on two other mechanisms that we use to try to promote industry university partnerships. The first is uh, UC Discovery Conference Grants, which is the grant that's supporting this conference. Um, these are awards of up to $15,000 um, that you can use to plan and host an event that brings together UC researchers and uh, members of industry. I've listed a few of the criteria here. Um, the most important one and the one that kind of trips people up is that we do ask that you submit it 60 days prior to your event. So start thinking about if you have anything coming up in like February or so, we'd love to hear about it. And then the other thing um, that students and postdocs might be interested in is that if you find uh, a UC Discovery uh, conference grant supported event on our website, we actually have travel awards available so you can apply for travel awards to attend other events on other campuses. And we do ask that all the events are open to all 10 campuses, so you can do that. And then the last um, item I wanted to touch on was the UC Discovery Fellowship, um, which Carol has been really helpful um, to us in sort of explaining to our fellows uh, what a great sort of open um, program uh, the campus of Berkeley has in intellectual property. This is a professional development program that's focusing on building up a cadre of professionals within the University of California who can help bridge the gap between industry and university um, participants and research. And so what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to attract people who have significant training in science or engineering, um, who are interested in sort of changing their career track a little bit and working more on the administrative side of the university to sort of help bridge the gap between industry um, and university uh, individuals. And you can check our website for more information about it if you're curious. If you're interested in applying for a UC Discovery Grant or learning more about any of those programs that I talked about, this is our website here. And um, we, as I mentioned before, our website lists upcoming uh, conference grant supported events that you can either attend or um, find out more about. And in terms of the UC Discovery Grants, we have calls for proposals twice a year. The fall, which we just completed, um, uh, getting proposals for is our primary call, and then we'll have another call in the spring if uh, funds remain uncommitted. So thanks again for allowing me the time to uh, speak today, and I will um, introduce Dan Portnoy um, and get on with the, uh, with the presentation. Thanks. To our panel discussion, um, this is how I would like to run it, if possible. We're going to go through the panel and 
if necessary, uh, give like a, a short introduction to yourself so we know who's on the panel, and I mean short, thir 30 seconds. Um, and then another rule I like to impose is that everybody is going to get a chance to speak, hopefully at least twice. And we have about three questions, topics. Um, ideally, it'll just be, it'll, it'll have a life of its own. But if not, we do have the questions um, to help guide us. And uh, I think I'll start, oh, do the introduction. We'll start with introductions. I'm Carol Mimora, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Intellectual Property and Industry Research Alliances, or IPRA. And IPRA consists of two peer divisions, the Office of Technology Licensing that obtains copyright and patent rights for the university Actually, and licenses them okay, um, to the commercial sector for commercial development and to real goods and services that benefit the public. The sibling division, the Industry Alliances Office, takes care of industry contracts in the opposite direction, bringing resources into Berkeley, such as funding, visitors, materials. Uh, we also set up strategic alliances, such as public-private partnerships with companies and private and product development partnerships. My name is... My name is... My name is David Cook. I'm the CEO of Anza Therapeutics. Anza is a privately held company. We're, we're funded by venture capitalists, uh, developing Listeria monocytogenes in a couple of different ways as a platform for uh, vaccination. We actually work with, with Dan, and we've, we've licensed intellectual property from Berkeley through, through Carol's office in the past. Um, we also have uh, significant interest in some of the um, par uh, emerging target, emer targets in the developing world, including malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis, and are working with some Gates-funded agencies in that regard. I'm, I'm John McAllanos. I'm chairman of microbiology at Harvard Medical School and professor there. I guess uh, I represent sort of the academic view of uh, the issue of developing uh, useful technologies and academic laboratories and figuring out ways to move them out of the lab and into uh, industry for development. Um, our department is, certainly has uh, plenty of uh, experience in startup companies that have uh, successfully done this, and we also uh, have a strong um, interaction with uh, both uh, funding agencies of the traditional sorts, but also uh, pharmaceutical companies that occasionally are interested in um, sponsored research within the department. And in doing that, I also uh, serve uh, uh, as uh, advisor to my faculty in trying to develop the appropriate relationships with uh, pharmaceutical companies that don't uh, bump up against the conflict of interest uh, rules at Harvard, which are substantial. Um, and finally, uh, I'll also note that um, at Harvard, as, as at the use, as UC system um, has. We have uh, fairly strict rules for the types of projects that graduate students and postdocs can participate in, uh, especially if those projects uh, have already been licensed out in terms of IP to startup companies or pharmaceutical companies. So there, there are interposed in, in that process uh, uh, evaluation sheets, for example, for graduate students where um, uh, the advisors are supposed to declare uh, whether they have a uh, financial interest in the project uh, directly uh, that the student, for example, is working on, and other types of watchdog, if you will, um, uh, sheets that need to be filled out on a regular basis to try to control conflicts of interest as best we can. That being said, you know the university still uh, very much encourages uh, appropriate technology to be licensed out of laboratories and into the appropriate uh, corporate environments for their development into products. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I, I think you heard about me this, uh, earlier today. <clears throat> I am, um, I've been in the vaccine field for 13 years, I've, and I <clears throat> earlier with, Nova, with Chiron and now with Novartis, I'm head of the uh, vaccine research, and <clears throat> also now as we set up this new institute that uh, was called MVGH that develops <laughs> vaccines. Uh, for neglected diseases only needed in developing countries, and I'm chairman of the board of this new institute. Okay, thank you. So I think that the first question I want to address is really just whether we in <coughs> academia should even be involved in vaccine research, 
And if so, um, what should we be doing here? When do we transfer to perhaps a small startup, as I think John has, and does it at the end have to end up in a, a larger pharmaceutical company such as Novartis? And I think, John, I'd like to ask you, because since you have started with basic research in an academic setting, and as we'll hear in your seminar later, taking it pretty darn far t towards vaccine, I'm, again, I'm not sure where you guys are, but tell me about the rela how, how you see um, basic science in academia being translated, and what's the b best avenue for that? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all here. It, it very much depends on the type of technology. Uh, sometimes the best way to develop a technology is simply to license it to um, the biggest partner you can find, a Novartis, a Merck, um, somebody who, who can really uh, take a, a very, very advanced and clear discovery uh, forward in an aggressive way. Uh, because they already have pre previously established, um, you know, the right resources, the right programs to do that. In other cases, vaccines or uh, drug discoveries uh, need to be developed uh, further before big pharma is even interested in them. And then sometimes the, the startup route uh, is more appropriate. Um, if there's a startup company, for example, that already has uh, an ongoing program licensure into those, uh, sometimes works for those. Typically, this day and age, it's harder and harder to actually, uh, for, a, for a, you know, a professor in an academic institution, to actually start a company based upon one discovery unless it's a platform company. So uh, if, if a technology represents something that can represent a lot of different products, then developing the platform seems to be an appropriate thing for a startup company to do. And those tend to be the types of companies that are getting started now, uh, in my experience, uh, in places like Harvard uh, by individual or a small number of faculty members. So one size doesn't fit all, Dan. It really depends on you know, the situation. If you discover a compound, an anti-malarial compound, one compound, and it's a, uh, you know, it's a composition of matter patent, it's usually better to do something like a license out than try to build a company around one compound. Any of you want to comment? Um. So I, I think there's certainly a role um, for, for academia, in particular um, a, a, an important role around basic biology, which um, is something that we, don't, we can't in a biotech company invest an enormous amount in. We have to actually keep our focus on the development process, um, whereas I think development naturally is not that interesting and it doesn't advance careers in academia. So there's sort of a natural division. Um, I'll also make the point that uh, maybe 10 years or so ago, <clears throat> you couldn't start a biotech company uh, developing a novel vaccine technology um, because vaccines, as, as Reno pointed out, were not an economically viable area. Certainly 15 years ago, that was true. Um, now they're, they're seen as probably the, the biggest single opportunity for growth in the pipelines of, of large pharma. And, and ultimately, um, if you're developing in particular a prophylactic vaccine, you have to look to large pharmaceutical companies to actually commercialize. It's, uh, uh, trials for prophylactic vaccines involve tens of thousands of subjects because you need a very large safety database in addition to the efficacy database. And so at the end of the food chain, whether you go through a biotech company or not, and I think the more novel the technology is, the better off you are having a biotech partner. But ultimately, you have to look to a, a, a Merck, a GSK, a Novartis to uh, do the phase three trials and the commercialization because vaccines just are enormous uh, development efforts um, costing many hundreds of millions of dollars. I would concur with that, and especially um, from where I sit at the university, um, I would be remiss if I didn't add to the list of licensing to an existing company and starting a new company and licensing the IP rights there. We in recent years have focused on public-private partnerships and product development partnerships, and in this area in particular, we have uh, really been impressed with the amount of funding that is available to us from foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Under um, a $42.6 million grant from the Gates Foundation, we actually established uh, a three-way collaboration with Berkeley uh, keeping $8 million to clone the genes for the malaria therapeutic, um, the artemisinic acid. 
artemisinin uh, for ACT therapies. The startup company Amaris had $12 million from that grant, which is much more than the typical startup company would have even in the first five years from traditional venture capital sources. And then the Institute for One World Health, the pharmaceutical company, albeit nonprofit, had $22.6 million to do the regulatory and clinical affairs. But the, but the beauty of this is that there will be, a, and they sub-licensed ultimately to Sanofi Aventis, is that six years after we signed a three-way collaboration agreement stating who would get what tranche of money and two licenses one each to the biotech and one to the pharma company, there will be a new drug on the market at tenfold less than the current price, which is $2.40 today. Um, the beauty of it is that each partner had their money from the very beginning from the Gates Foundation, so the research happened in parallel as opposed to in sequence, which is the way it usually goes, normally starting with federal funding. So, um, Reno, and from, from the from the big pharma point of view, I mean, when is it that you that you guys want to get involved? I mean, start straight from an academic lab, or you want to let a smaller company develop it for a while before you get involved? But usually, <clears throat> the you start to get involved in the science quite early, <clears throat> and and the dialogue helps to drive the scientists in academia to understand which are the questions that need to be addressed to move forward. Uh, so, be, uh, I mean, I think the uh, dialogue, the earlier it starts, the better it is. At the time that is, uh, is appropriate for to transfer to a, a biotech or large, larger pharma, it depends. Or you, tra you transfer pretty early to, <clears throat> to a biotech, a larger pharma will wait for something that, where you can put the machine or development. So when it's ready, it's ready to go, usually. That, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's the typical pattern. Sometimes, for things which are uh, pretty mature already at the discovery stage, a large pharma can do the things directly. But usually large phar pharma waits for, I mean, the, the big thing of a larger pharma is that can actually do what you were saying. I mean, spend tens of millions GMP manufacturing, uh, put all the regulatory, the clinical experience, do 10, 20, 30,000. Uh, people clinical trials that is impossible to any other uh, small biotech or <clears throat> or uh, even medium sized biotech and academia so is it fair to say that at the end of the day all of these vaccine efforts are going to end up in one of three companies <laughs> <laughs> well there is no i mean uh, uh, before Novartis was in in Cairo and Chiron was not a small biotech, it was one of the largest and successful and profitable biotechs. Uh, but we were struggling. We were struggling because when, I mean, we brought a lot of things to phase one, two, that's fine, you can do that. Well, then when you go to phase three, I mean, you need another plant, it's a $300 million investment, and you need your phase three, it's under $50 million investment, and I mean, in, in Chiron, that where we spent uh, I mean, half a billion a year in R&D, we didn't have that money. So that there, there are five, Dan. Sanofi, Pasteur, and Wyeth, but there's our five. Okay, we're, we're going to move on to another topic, but before we do, uh, let me open it up if there's any one or two uh, insightful and burning questions for the audience. <laughs> All of them. My students, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the question was when do we transfer, but another question could be when do we partner, because we might be partnering in to leverage our respective resources and to get grants that we share uh, without technology being ready to transfer per, per se. Okay. Um, I think one of the areas that really surprised me was this area of intellectual property, and I'm not sure, I think I'll let Carol even tell us what that means. Uh, for some, many of you in the audience, but that ends up being a real issue because if the goal of our group SEND is to bring things to the vaccines and therapeutics to the developing world, you know, we don't really care about intellectual property, but companies do. And so that creates uh, a potential conflict. So Carol, why don't you start by explaining what IP even okay. is? Well, um, IP <laughs> takes many forms. Um, Essentially, intellectual property is an intangible right. It's a right to exclude others from doing something. In the case of patents, 
when a person is a patentee and, and gets a patent from the US government, they can exclude a person without a license to practice that patent from doing that which is taught in that patent. So, and in the case of copyright, a person who receives copyright protection through the government, they can prevent others from copying that which they are the author, the creator of. So at the university, the employees who work here create patents and copyrights, also trademark. Trademark is another form of IP, um, but, and the office manages it. But we have a special program in this area uh, called the Socially Responsible Licensing Program. It's but one IP management strategies among many that we are using over and over in order to induce funding for neglected and tropical diseases. Because uh, as many have said before, for lack of a profit driver, the big pharmaceutical companies don't invest in diseases that don't exist in the developed world. It's simply market economics. So we saw a role um, for the university to play in inducing investment where traditional um, market inducements don't exist, including through a combination of carrots and sticks. A carrot would be the grant of a non-exclusive license to a biotech company if they make this extraordinary investment. They don't have to pay us a running royalty, mm. but they can have the right to develop the um, whatever it is that UC has patented. We would also require them, though, in exchange for the free license, to define a charitable use and distribute the products under patent, either for free or at cost, in certain target com countries. And we negotiate with each company uh, for each geography. We would typically want them to provide drugs um, at cost or for free in areas where um, those countries are defined as low or middle income by the World Health Organization, and there are many other standards. Um, in that Gates deal, there were 88 countries on that list, including the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, that are quite hard fought with the for-profit companies, such as the pharmaceutical companies, because in those geographies, there are significant middle and upper classes where they expect to make a profit. In the case of that deal of, with the malaria drug, the ultimate vendor, the Institute for One World Health, is a non-profit pharmaceutical. So they were happy to have those countries with the bifurcated population strata um, on the list where they would serve. So the goal of the program is access and affordability to drugs, therapies, and um, vaccines. Also, um, we have deals under that agreement under, for sanitation, such as water purification, and one for bio-fortified sorghum for sub-Saharan Africa. Any other comments about IP? And sure. So I actually think in this area, the IP is actually, no, in my view, no, no longer a great barrier to doing these kinds of deals. And I, uh, just a couple of examples. Um, when, when the antiretrovirals were, there was a, a big effort to introduce them into Africa and, and uh, uh, the developing world, certainly uh, pharmaceutical companies fought that effort and they had certain concerns about IP violation, about products being sold cheaply in one market and then leaking back into another market, um, and about knockoff drugs. And in fact, pharma companies now recognize that they can have very distinct pricing in two, mar two markets, that they can actually even out license their manufacturing technologies to companies in India and, China and, and Brazil. Uh, and, and, and Gates even, when, when you do a Gates deal, uh, Gates allows you to say, you can actually divide China up, for instance, into the, the nonprofit um, uh, sector within China and the pro sector where you can make money. You can't make as much money per patient in China in the middle class, but nonetheless, there's there's real money to be made there. And pharma companies and, and, um, uh, and Gates have worked this out as well, as well as biotechs. I think the other example, and I'll just, uh, you know, the, the institute that, that Novartis has set up, is essentially Novartis is saying you can have access to our, our technology, which by the way, there's a lot of intellectual property that is there. So intellectual property really can be solved and it's no longer, it shouldn't be the reason why you do or do not uh, develop something for the developing world. John, does, does Harvard uh, also see things this way? Well, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. <laughs> it really, uh, again, sort of depends on um, some of the perceived uh, value of a particular product being considered. So uh, they also have uh, been exercising much more of a socially responsible kind of licensing strategy for uh, particularly drugs and therapeutics and vaccines for uh, uh, neglected diseases. Um, of the developing world, and um, I think um, 
we need to see more of these come all the way across the finish line for all the parties, uh, including even the licensing uh, offices of universities completely buy into it. Um, I won't spend a lot of time in my talk about these issues uh, for something like a cholera vaccine, but I agree with you, the, the Gates Foundation has been uh, creative in talking to pharmaceutical companies about uh, the need to um, be willing to walk away from IP if, uh, if it turns out that there's a path to manufacture, for example, of an effective vaccine that they help prove is effective um, in a developing world country where the products might be able to be made cheaper, but uh, hopefully there'll be assurances that those products will not drift back into the United States, for example. So uh, in the case of the cholera vaccine, a startup company that uh, had licensed that technology uh, eventually worked with um, a not-for-profit, the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul, Korea, to, um, to secure initial round of funding, about $5 million, to begin looking at uh, the safety and efficacy of the vaccine in, um, in target uh, endemic populations in Bangladesh, but to, to get the uh, startup company to agree to let the not-for-profit do those studies in a developing world site, the not-for-profit had to, had to go into an agreement with the Gates Foundation and the startup uh, to uh, define the time and, and you know, conditions under which Gates could basically say, this vaccine works, we want to manufacture it in China, and we want to sell it at, or give it away in Bangladesh, and the pharmaceutical company had to say, we agree you to do that, but you can't sell it as a traveler's vaccine in the US and Europe, for example. So those kinds of bifurcated agreements where it's quite clear there's a path to develop um, a developing world product uh, by a foundation using their uh, significant resources, you know, those, those deals are getting done now. I have personal experience with one, but I'd love to see it completed um, so that we can use it more and more as an example of you know, here's how it can be done and everybody wins. Um, that's the question is the one at the end is, will there be ever a case where we end up with not just a developing world product, but also a developing world product with uses in the developed world where the company eventually gets paid appropriately for giving up their technology for further development. Any comments about IP issues, Reno? Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, obviously, IP is extremely important. I mean, it's the only, it's the only reason why uh, companies make money, and so they can invest in research and development. So <clears throat> the, there's not going to be any innovation or any venture funds or things like that without IP. Now, IP is pretty solid now in Western world. It's pretty weak in the many... Uh, in most of the uh, other South America, Asia, things like that. However, now the, the companies there, and the, uh, especially young vaccine manufacturers, are Me Too companies. They are basically copying what Western world used to do 15, 20 years ago. So now they, and they now start to make a little bit of money. And so they would like to do the next step, which is do innovation. And now they feel they need IP. <laughs> because, yeah, because otherwise they will not be able to develop. So I think the IP concept is going to develop also in developing countries. So to me, IP is fundamental. It's, it's in this type of economy, no IP, no, no development, no new inventions, no new things. <clears throat> the, the question is different whether, I mean, is the IP going to be a barrier to make products available to developing countries? And they should not be at all. And that's the things of the, uh, the initiative of the Gates, our institute. But there you don't say IP is not important. What you say is that I believe that I, IP is very important, but I'm prepared to uh, not make profit at, out of this IP to make sure that these medicines or vaccines are made available at an affordable price to developing countries. So I think IP is important, has to be uh, always kept in mind, but should not be a barrier to make uh, <coughs> the, I mean, medicines and vaccines available to people in developing countries. And so there's a role Is Amy from the law school here? Okay, <laughs> so uh, we had a provocative conversation the other day where I think you were talking about a world without IP. 
<laughs> whatever, or patents, I forgot what it was, but why don't you, here, let me, you, I think we would like to hear from you. So I think that Carol and Berkeley's socially responsible licensing program is a phenomenal way to ensure both access and innovation. Um, and I have a couple of questions for the panelists. The first being to challenge some of this notion that IP is no longer much of a problem. Um, and so right now, Novartis, for example, is prosecuting a patent in India that is extremely important for um, AIDS patients, and there's a very small market, that a very small amount of money that, that Novartis could be making, but they are still prosecuting this patent in India. So some clarification on your international licensing. Also, to push back on the notion that IP is the only way that we're going to develop new innovation, and this also is a question um, kind of lar more broadly to academics and to companies. Um, are you prepared to explore alternatives through a prize fund, um, as has been suggested, through patent pooling, as is being implemented on an international level through global buyers? What are some alternatives that you are prepared to explore to ensure that we do actually um, have licensing, have competition, and have access throughout the world? Um, does anybody want to start with that? I can. <laughs> what are these? I, I, I mean, the, not my area. So. <laughs> no, I mean, there are many different ways. I mean, it's not that I want IP. Uh, and saying in this economic system that maybe is collapsing, so it's not a big, <laughs> going to be a problem any longer. But in the economic system that we had up to two months ago, <laughs> there was no way to get innovation without protection of IP. IP is, is a question of, I mean, is, you invent something and you get, became, become a proprietor uh, of an invention and you are able to sell that product in exclusivity for a while. Now, <clears throat> and as I said before, you not, cannot, you really to avoid to make the mistake to uh, see IP as a barrier to do things to developing countries. <clears throat> I think we all agree that you need to make things available to developing countries. And <clears throat> the way to do it is that you make, for companies, you make profit in the Western world, and you are prepared to not to make profit, and therefore donate your property to developing countries, say, I recognize you can afford, you do it. You mentioned India. India is not a problem of availability. Glibeck is given for free in India by Novartis to all the people who cannot afford. So it was not a problem of access. It was a problem of the Indian government that wanted to steal the IP, the proprietary compound, and to make it available to the Indian companies. It was not about giving making the drug available to the people. So it's like if you, I mean, if you want to donate a dollar to someone, I mean, you are happy to, do, to donate if they need it, but if they come to your house and steal a dollar, you are upset. And that's what was happening. Yeah, I'll, I'll just also comment. So India, India and China, for instance, represent, I mean, Merck's right now projecting that in, in a few years, they'll have a $2 billion market in those countries. So they're not insignificant commercial opportunities for pharma and therefore for even for biotech companies. What you have to do is figure out ways to have separate channels of distribution to the indigent and to the people who can afford. And I, I do think those things are being worked out even now. So and that point one. Point two, your comment about a prize, uh, for instance, and I think an HIV vaccine is a perfect example. If I were to try to go out and I had great technology, we do have great technology, and if I were to try to go out and raise money from venture capitalists saying I'm going to develop an HIV vaccine, I would get zero funding, simply because it's such a hard problem and there have been so many failures that no venture capitalist will put money at it. Um, on the other hand, if there's a, a, a prize, that can actually motivate small companies. It's unlikely to motivate a large pharmaceutical company. It, it, you know, Tell me how big you want the prize to be. Is it 
$100 million, $500 million. That, in, in principle, for a good product, is six months of revenue or, or a year of revenue. It's not an ongoing revenue flow. So I think you have to ask the question, um, does, the, does the price concept work generally? I think it works for some problems and for small companies. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a solution to eliminate IP and then just and then create prizes around uh, solving important problems. Because if the problem doesn't have an ongoing market, the prize only works for a, a limited number of, of businesses. Um, to pick up on the point of um, incentives for corporations in order to do the right thing in the developing world, I think it's an interesting model that Sanofi Aventis with the Berkeley malaria drug is taking up uh, the baton to go the last mile or the last kilometer to provide this drug at 10, 10 cents, um, tenfold, at a tenfold reduction, 24 cents, uh, from the existing uh, Novartis drug not entirely for altruistic reasons, but because when they do um, navigate the arduous regulatory systems in certain places such as Sub-Saharan Africa under the best conditions under which they're getting expedited approval because they're providing a malaria drug in a great area of need, that's a tremendous uh, driver and that's a big incentive because once they, once they have a presence in those countries where they have navigated the systems, um, they could sell other dr drugs that they have. So there is that. Also with the new um, pharmaceutical reform uh, laws, a company investing in a tropical disease can get an expedited priority review voucher from the FDA to use on their own behalf for a drug that could have a market in the developed world, or they can transact it, they can sell it or barter it. We've estimated that it could be worth $300 million to them to get that because it shaves so much time off of the uh, U.S. regulatory system. And then on the, on the issue of patent pools, I'm a big proponent of patent pooling. Uh, I just finished an agreement with the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation. So if anyone at Berkeley is working on hereditary neuropathy, and in particular Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome, we have the agreement ready to go. Uh, but the beauty of that approach is that the foundation says, and we agree, that this is really under-resourced. Uh, there, we have to do everything we can to solve a very rare disease. Mm -hmm. So the terms of their uh, agreement says, you know, we will, we will fund 10 sites, but the deal is that unlike your usual approach to IP, you, the university, can still own it, but we will pool it. We, as the foundation, will pool it, and there's good reason for that. Number one, it's hard enough to get any biotech or pharmaceutical company to invest in a rare disease or neglected disease, but it lowers the barrier even more if they can then have access to all the resultant IP from those 10 sites through one agreement, because it's been it's been aggregated by the funder. Also, it would be virtually impossible or it would be a high barrier for the ultimate licensee to go to those 10 sites and negotiate an agreement from each of them. And then even if they were to do that, they might be conflicting. So I think it's a, it's a great leap forward and that these pooling mechanisms could actually induce investment for these under-resourced diseases. Um, I'm gonna take some questions from the audience, I think, especially from for you students to think about um, some questions, but let's start with Pam, who's one of our later speakers today. How, what provisions are made to provide for the intellectual um, property rights of indigenous peoples? Um, and I'm thinking about uh, the fact that uh, artemisin, for instance, was an herbal medicine. Statins are also herbal medicines in China, have been used widely throughout the population. Um, how is that issue dealt with? And is there any way to compensate those people? Yeah. This is a big issue in Ghana where I'm working right now because in every village, there are a lot of plants that are used medicinally, some of proven uh, efficacy depending on your standards. But there's a great concern about, about actually even submitting them for testing because of this issue. Thanks for that question. Uh, we have an agreement with the Commonwealth of Samoa on access to the uh, plant that is indigenous there, the mamala tree. And apparently, the bark of the mamala tree has prostratin activity, which is an antiviral. And essentially, our agreement says that the government will facilitate access to this and also to the particular shaman and the people with indigenous knowledge. They will also facilitate export of the raw materials. In the agreement, we, we said explicitly that if we if we end up um, with research materials, we will name plasmids after, to give attribution to the villages and the individuals. We will also share revenue. We're sharing 50% of the net revenue, should there ever be any. Um, and this is 
distributed through the Ecology Foundation down to um, the government, the villages, the district, and the individual um, people with indigenous knowledge. In the case of the malaria drug, we don't have patents right on point to intellectual property that was developed outside of Berkeley. But we, we agree that, that attribution is an important component of a socially responsible licensing program. I was just going to comment. I'm, I'm quite sure that you know companies like Novartis also, if they're going to harvest natural products from a company, will enter or from a country will enter into an agreement with that country ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I, yes. I don't think there's much you know, going out and exploiting people. They're very cautious about that. So it takes roughly 10 years to bring a drug to market to deal with some disease. If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky. Uh, and it costs yeah. an awful amount of money. Um, the emerging drug-resistant diseases uh, are mutating at a rate that's much faster than that. And I wonder, if, what are the bottlenecks in the drug production process? And what are the bottlenecks in terms of cost? What, is it all the scientific development that costs money? Is it the legal aspects that cost money? Uh, how does this break down? And is this, how, how, can, how can the process be streamlined, I guess, if we're going to deal with these drugs and these uh, diseases in the future as they emerge? We want to hear the answer to this. Um, John's supposed to be starting and uh, speaking in like five minutes, I okay. believe. Is that I, correct? I'll, I'll make a very short comment. I think, right. I think one thing that I think my colleagues in industry will both agree and agree about is that there are some regulatory rules right now that are incredibly onerous and costing companies both uh, a lot of money to deal with if they want to go down the path of a drug development. Uh, but also uh, really are discouraging many companies from just plain getting into the business of d drug development for certain things. So for example, the one that you know, I know personally about is, is um, the equivalency rule for antibiotics. Uh, you could develop a new class of antibiotic that works absolutely as good, uh, so to speak, as uh, a mainline antibiotic, uh, cephalosporin, uh, you know, uh, quinolone or something like that, but you actually have to design a study where you show that before companies will give you a license. And if your compound, for example, uh, has a pesky problem like resistance, uh, it can be held up even in an equivalency study because they just a priori say, well, you got resistance mutants, when, when in fact your intention is to get the drug licensed and then combine it with other drugs to use combination therapy to suppress the chances of resistance. So there's all kinds of these uh, pesky rules that are preventing people from developing the next generation of drugs and have them in a bottle ready to go when resistance emerges to your first line drugs because you, you simply can't generate the kind of money to generate those equivalency trials very easily. They, the price goes up tenfold to show equivalence over efficacy. Just to, to support that a little bit, in, in the field of immunotherapy, the, there's a, a very attractive idea of combining novel agents together. But when you think about the regulatory risk, meaning that you're going to have a, an event, an adverse event with one of them, or when you put them together, that will, one will affect the other, the financial risk. Remember, when you do a phase three trial, the, the way you make that product has to be identical to the way you make it when you're on the market. So you have to make an enormous manufacturing investment long before you ever get to phase three. Uh, when we're talking about um, the cost of patient studies, so, you know, in a cancer study, you can spend $50,000 per patient. And if, you've, if you're doing a 2,000 patient study, and there are cancer studies that are that large, it's a, it's a, it's a huge amount of money, $100 million. So, and then the other thing is as technology gets better, FDA's standards for what you need to show both scientifically and from a safety perspective go up. And that, just the fact that we have better technology means that we have to apply that technology, which adds to cost. Well, maybe I can add another factor, which is that basically uh, development of uh, drugs and vaccines is a business of failure. Uh, where, I mean, in order to get a successful one takes 10, 15 years. And for a successful one, you have, hundreds that die in preclinical stage, many in phase one, many in phase two, many in phase three. When you go down, uh, unless you can have all those failures, you cannot have success. So you need to be able in your R&D pipeline to be able to support all the failures. The last topic, we don't have 
that much time is really what the relationship is between us active emissions and the industry because we really have competing incentives. I mean, we need uh, our, our product is papers, <laughs> uh, really, and that's not as important. And so the relationship can get, um, is, is, is tricky. I mean, personally, I found that both groups could be satisfied and that we both can learn from each other. Um, but I was just curious about uh, how we manage the different uh, incentives of the two groups who are tr hopefully working together in a synergistic fashion. Well, the companies that we have mo the most success with are those that realize that our input will be primarily basic research, academically appropriate research, that the university's role is to accelerate innovation and catalyze commercialization, but never to take it from bench to bedside. But I suppose what I found working with a company is that they, they, have, they put a much larger effort and I'm doing something mom and pop research in my lab, maybe just pop. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the old paradigm of one postdoc, one gene. And, <laughs> and I know for a fact that if I could get a, you know, a robot and a few million bucks, I can move this much quickly, more quickly, but that's what you guys can do. So it gets a little dicey there. Um, perhaps we're done. <laughs> <laughs>